psychological abusers are attracted to success. So they go for strengths. So the more successful by the world's definitions that we do have blessings come to us, the more hidden abusers we're going to recognize have sort of jumped on as you know, trying to pick little pieces of flesh. So it is not for those that, you know, oh, I'm weak or oh, I'm this, or it's actually you become a target the more successful you become. You're listening to the Redefining Wealth podcast with Patrice Washington. This is the space that you come to each and every week to learn more about what it means to chase purpose, not money. Because in this community, we have a different perspective of wealth. We understand that wealth is not just about money and material possessions. We believe in the original 12th century definition of wealth, which says it's about the condition of well-being. And so we talk about the parts of life where we need to be well if we're going to get to the wealth building phases of our journey. So I'm really excited about today's guest because as I've shared with you, this entire season is about redefining love, love of self, love of God, and love for others. And I know personally that, you know, I've been on such a self-love journey and some of that had to come from no longer romanticizing reality. That means that I had to really be honest about what I was experiencing, and then get the tools and resources to help me figure out what that really was. And it's, it's, it's a big thing. It's a lot. So I want us to dive into this conversation with Dr. Shannon Thomas, who's a friend of the Redefining Wealth podcast. You have heard her here before, but before I read her bio, let's get to the affirmation of the week. You know, you got to speak positivity into your life. To your day. Um, yeah. You gotta affirm positivity. You gotta affirm abundance. You gotta affirm yourself to well. This week's affirmation is I enforce my boundaries with ease. To protect my personal relationships and honor my personal commitments, I put boundaries in place in my professional life. I understand people will not treat me how I treat them, but how I treat myself. My boundaries are an act of self-love and self-care. And when I choose to honor them, it makes the people and things I choose to allow in my life more in alignment with how I see my life. I have and exercise the right to require people to treat me how I want to be treated in any setting. People can choose to honor my limits or accept the consequences, but my boundaries define how I'm willing to spend my most precious resources, including my money, time, and energy. They define what I will and will not accept in my life and how I will respond if someone fails to respect those boundaries. Declare it with me today. I enforce my boundaries with ease. All right, so here we go. Shannon Thomas, LCSW, is the international best-selling author of Healing from Hidden Abuse, a journey through the stages of recovery from psychological abuse and exposed and exposing financial abuse when money is a weapon, which she talked about on the podcast before. She's also the owner and lead therapist of an award-winning counseling practice in South Lake, Texas. Thomas is the founder of the Keep Dreaming Big Project, which is a 501c3, which grants life enriching wishes for survivors of abuse. Without further ado, here is Shannon Thomas. Hi, Good Shannon. Morning. Hey, Patrice. I've been really looking forward to getting the <sighs> chance to chat with you again. I had such a good time last time. And so now I'm glad we finally get to sit down. It's been a bit, it's been a minute, it's been a it's few been years. A minute. Yes. <laughs> so been a many minute. things uh, have lots changed. Of minutes in between. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we've gone through a whole pandemic since then. That was like pre pandemic when you came yes. on. Yes. When yeah. life is like fuzzy and fun and easy. And now. <laughs> And now it's just been like wild and, whew, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, but I I've, like your six pillars because the six pillars have gotten me through some really honestly, probably the hardest years of my adult life. The really? last few years have been so hard. And the going back to those six pillars is just the anchors that have been keeping me going. But I've added a seventh and it's sort of the no shits given pillar. <laughs> I don't know if I can say that. <laughs> yes, you can. And I love it. You know what, Shannon? I think I've been living from that pillar. I just mm -hmm. never put a name on it. <laughs> and the reason is, is because when we get through the first six and we really root down into those, there's going to be people in our lives that whether they're close people or whether they're just sort of like nomads on the internet are going to not like us. They're not going to like kind of the six pillar us because they're going to be like, oh, look at her. She's kind of thinks she's all that now or all this or whatever. And that's not the case at all. It's like, no, I'm just not codependent anymore. No, mm. I'm not making excuses for poor behavior anymore. So that we get to the no shits given pillar of <laughs> I'm going to live my life the way I'm called to live it, the way is in, you know, embodying what our purposes are caring about those that care about us. But at the end of the day, sometimes we just have to keep going. And that is what these last few oh. years have been for me personally. Oh, me too. Mm. Me too. And I love the way that you articulate that because people really do start to struggle with you. I, like I, I've said this on Instagram, no one is more bothered by your boundaries than someone who no longer benefits yeah. from you not knowing that it was okay to have boundaries, right? Like no one yes. is more bothered by that. Mm -hmm. And so when you step into this space, which really does come from like getting rooted in the pillars and understanding who you are in each, each one of those areas, you're not seeking all this validation from people. You're not seeking their approval. You're not waiting for them to give you the nod to move or not move or do this mm -hmm. or do that. And people are like, you've lost your mind. You're in a midlife right. crisis. What is happening with you? I'm trusting myself. I yeah, love and myself. And, yeah. And, yeah. And in rooting down deep into that faith pillar, when we root and anchor there and really start looking at all those other pillars and get them all going together at once and hanging on to them. I mean, there've been times and that's kind of what has kept the wheels from just flying off completely of this, of this, you know, truck or yeah. whatever. But uh, yeah, when we no longer are serving other people in our people pleasing in our codependency and are worried about what people think, they're just like, well, wait, what happened to her? Well, you know, mm -hmm. it just got healthier. Ooh. Yeah, I'm healing. Some, yeah, this is what healing looks like. And there are some people that don't really like that. They don't. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. <laughs> I love it. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to start um, this interview today because last time you were here and we talked about financial abuse. Yeah. And, you know, at the time, I think I knew about hidden abuse, but didn't even consider it to be a thing for me. Right. I had no idea that I was experiencing psychological abuse. Mm. None I'm whatsoever. sorry that you did. Yeah. 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 And I want to start with just loving something in your acknowledgement. In the acknowledgement, it's to your husband, mm -hmm. hot stuff. Yep. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Which is funny because I, when I wrote the book, I never actually expected anyone to read it. <laughs> Like I just had it in me and I needed to write it and I wanted to write it. And so I was like, okay, I'm not going to put his real name out there, but I was going to give him, I'm going to put what I always call him. So now when he goes to work, especially after like the book came out, people would be like, Hey, hot stuff. And he's yeah. like, Oh my oh gosh. My gosh. <laughs> and now it is on this podcast. So, Hey, <laughs> <laughs> so I love this to, to hot stuff. I love yeah. what you say here. You're an example of a man who wants his wife to grow morph, and change for the better without being threatened by her newfound inner strength and independent spirit. Amen. It gives me chills hearing that. And that's still and it true. It gives me hope. Yeah. It gives you chills, but it gives me hope to know that that's okay. Cause this, this is something that I've been seeing quite a bit since announcing my divorce last year. What I hear from people in the DMs quite often is this idea that, you know, it's so sad that once women start making more money or they become the breadwinner, um, they just up and leave their families. Mm 
Oh, that's not what happened at all. But thank you for dropping into my DMs and dropping some poison and just scurry along there, folks. Yeah. And I go and I'm going to do something um, around this, but I felt like this conversation would be great um, to kind of address this because going back to being rooted in the six pillars and then adding that seventh when, <laughs> when you're really feeling good, right? right? Is people don't understand that the career and financial success they may see are the natural byproduct of doing the work in the pillars. But that's what Amen. you see. What yeah. you don't see is the increase in self-love and decrease in tolerance for behavior that no longer serves you. And what yeah. you see is, oh, a woman's making more money. So she's going to go break up her family as opposed to she's been doing all of this inner work. And she now recognizes that something is not right. And she will not live like this any longer. Right. But Amen. you see the outward stuff and think it's about that, the audacity. Good word. Good word. People have the audacity to, uh, you know, watch from a distance or even slightly in the circle and think they have all the information. And especially with anything that looks like hidden abuse, psychological abuse, those covert abuses, they are not going to see it. They're not going to know it, even if they're standing on the doorstep of it. Sometimes they don't even see it in their own situation. So then they certainly cannot then see it in somebody else's situation. But it is audacious to be able to think that just because somebody has reached a certain level of success, that they are so cavalier about the things, especially people of faith, that that's a real judgment, you know, which happens to be a sin as well, too. So we just <laughs> we can talk about that. <laughs> but do people really do think that they have it all, you know, figured mm -hmm. out and because they see this persona or they see this sort of image that they want to uh, attach to you. And that itself is super toxic mm -hmm. instead you know, of knowing the heart. Yeah. What I realized over the years too, is how often you may talk to someone and because they can't see the hidden abuse or the toxicity, right? It's not as um, easily or readily like, what's the word I'm looking for? Like you can't, it's hidden, right? So you can't well, see it like you might with physical abuse or something well, like, like that. Literally in the back of the book, it says there are no holes in the walls. There are no broken bones. There are no bruises. All that is held within the survivor of the psychological abuse. So that's how it goes to being where people don't recognize it. And even survivors are the very first stage of the six stages, because you have the six pillars and I have the six mm -hmm. stages, mm -hmm. is despair because a lot of people don't even know that what they're going through is psychological abuse. They just know that they're feeling poisoned. They know that they feel like they're being turned upside down in the water. So it's very difficult when we don't have the language to describe psychological abuse to then even understand it ourselves or mm -hmm. for other people to really understand it. Cause it can kind of sound normal. Like you try to talk to somebody without actual verbiage and actual language for psychological abuse. And they might be like, all relationships have that. What are you complaining yeah. about? Everyone has their ups and downs. And then right. and then they help you romanticize reality. Like, oh my gosh. I mean, you just got a new car. Like, mm -hmm. girl, I would, I've been trying to get a new car with a bow on it, like as yeah. a surprise, right? So then they start to like romanticize all mm -hmm. of this stuff. And I recognize after the fact that some things were really more about control. Like it really yeah. wasn't about like me. <laughs> like yes. a yeah. genuine, you know what I mean? It was like, I do. this wasn't really for me. This was more about what it made you look like. A hundred percent. And the more bows on cars that are going on, metaphorically speaking, the harder it is for the survivor to get other people to recognize, no, 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 there's, there's a persona here, or there's a facade here, there's a constructed reality, there's a constructed narrative happening. And the more of those outward expressions of love or outwards expressions of appreciation that are pretty hollow. And here's the survivor. It's supposed to be like smiling and excited and has like all these porcupine needles stuck in them emotionally. Ooh. And we're standing next to the car with the bow and the porcupine needles all covered that nobody sees. Mm. So let's go back. I want you to give us some examples of hidden abuse. Okay. So that's a broad question. Whatever examples, you want to share. <laughs> yeah. Well, examples would be gaslighting. You know, 2022's word of the year from Webster's Dictionary was gaslighting. That is not just 
a difference of opinion. Gaslighting is truly like a conversation did not happen. And the abuser will say, yes, it did. I told you, here's where we were. This is what was going on. And the survivor is like, I am very clear that we did not have that conversation. And the reason that those moments are important is because if the abuser can get the survivor to think, okay, I just don't have a good memory. I'm suddenly needing more sleep. I, I, I not trust themselves. Then the abuser can take all control over the narrative and all control over the memory. We talked about this loan we were going to take out. No, we didn't. Or we talked about this other, you know, plans of uh, a trip I was going to go on. No, we actually didn't talk about that. So gaslighting is one example. And it's just, I equate hidden abuse to like poison and water. You don't really see it until you start to feel it. And you can start to feel something is not right. This is not just a normal couple or even in a family situation or in a workplace. And also with hidden abuse, it's about the intentionality. So let's say we have silence with somebody. We decide that they're just kind of like, we need to put some distance and they're just not the type of person we wanna have in our life or close to us. That silence, the intentionality is for boundaries, it's for health, it's just, I'm just gonna pull back a bit. I just need some distance from this person. I'm seeing some behaviors I don't like. Intentionality of the silent treatment is to make somebody insecure, unstable, chasing after the abuser, a puppet on a puppet string. So even though we may see silence as like the initial billboard, we have to look in the behind it is what's the intentionality of it. And in hidden abuse, the intentionality is really telling. Is it to make someone anxious, insecure, uh, feeling worried about different things within the, if it's a relationship of their fidelity of their, you know, good intentions for the relationship. Mm. How else does hidden abuse show up? Yeah, it can show up like um, we've got intermittent reinforcement where people will behave one way one day and then the next day they're just cold, they're distant. It's kind of the moody, the back and forth. And I always look at it like this. It's kind of this push and pull. It's the come close, I love you. And then it's the stonewalling or it's the pushing away. Um, a relationship has intermittent reinforcement. That's what that's that back and forth. And so what it ends up creating is like a trauma bond where the body of the survivor becomes dependent on that, this part from the abuser. So when this happens, it's like a whole bunch of adrenaline, cortisol, nervous system kind of going haywire. Hidden abuse is also uh, with the relationship can be the idealization stage where it's all of the good things about the survivor that the abuser loves, you know, all the things that brought the moth to the light, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's all the sunshiny things. And then there's the, the devaluing stage. So the first stage is the idealization stage. The second is the devalue. That's where they start nitpicking and everything that they liked about the survivor in the idealization stage now becomes a problem. Mm. So now in the devaluing stage, Every little thing is sort of like picked at and what can treat and critiqued and things aren't correct and it needs to be done this way. And, and no longer is it sort of that idea of expecting the best from the other person. Now the abuser is expecting the worst. And then comes the discard. But a discard isn't always leaving. A discard right. can sometimes be emotionally checking out of the relationship. So hidden abuse often always includes mm -hmm. the idealization, the devaluing and the discarding, but a discard isn't always the physical leaving. Okay. So I know that another word that has to be one of the most popular words uh, <laughs> searched is narcissism. Right. Mm -hmm. And I love yeah. in the book that you don't like make it about just narcissism. It's really about yeah. toxic behavior. Yes. Um, yeah. In general, why do you do that? I do that because I'm a licensed clinician. I'm a licensed therapist. And so to talk about narcissism would be to talk about narcissistic personality disorder. And that's an actual diagnosis. And I could never diagnose anyone I've never seen. Mm -hmm. So for me, I find it easier rather than talking about narcissistic abuse, which has been the wave that's come. And we have in this genre grown so much over the last you know, several years. My first book came out in 2016 and there were several people before me that put out great books. And then a whole bunch of books came since then. And 
billions of hits on TikTok and other platforms around this topic of hidden abuse and psychological abuse, but it's been kind of renamed narcissistic abuse. And I don't really fall into that pattern of calling it narcissistic abuse because that also then leads to would the person be diagnosed as narcissistic personality disorder? And I don't know that. But what I can say is what are toxic behaviors? What are behaviors that, you know, if a new client comes in and sits down and starts talking about some of the things that they're experiencing with someone in home or the workplace or religious setting, because this happens also in spiritual groups. So. Uh, yeah, we're going to get to yeah, that. <laughs> it happens in all kinds of different areas and within our families. So if someone comes in, what I do is I start listening for clues. It's like a pebble and a pebble or like a piece of a jigsaw puzzle. And then the picture comes into play. Just like if a doctor was to look at a lab work and go, okay, this is off over here. That's putting it all together is how we know, okay, those are psychologically abusive behaviors. Mm -hmm. But that's why I don't really call it narcissistic abuse because I think it's better to talk about the behaviors than actually a diagnosis. Yeah, I have to say, um, kind of going back to the, you know, hidden abuse that happens in religious places. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have to say that for many years, I really relied on Christian counselors oh, um, yeah. and pastors. Yeah. And looking back, I can say wholeheartedly, and I don't think it was always intentional, but I can say wholeheartedly that I feel that they were just as manipulative um, when it came to giving advice that made it seem like I needed to pray more and I oh, yeah. needed to be more faithful and, yes. you know, to God, and I mm -hmm. needed to fast more and I mm -hmm. needed to understand, you know, the pressures that are on, like all of the weight very much felt like it was constantly on me. Yes. And I look back and many of those, you know, sessions are why I ended up with a prayer room and why I ended up, you know, mm -hmm. having the sense of faith that I have. However, I believe a lot of it was from a very toxic place because there was no accountability on the other no. side. No. I constantly had to take all of the accountability and bear the weight. Um, and a part of that makes me still upset because I trusted so many people throughout these last 20 years or so who I don't feel actually counseled from a healthy place. I think they no. just like, you know, held the standard that, in a, and I, I don't want to say this for all, but just in girlfriends that I've spoken to and other people that I've met throughout the years, you know, more recently, mm -hmm where a lot of women feel like they were so responsible, yet we're told we're not the head of the household, but yet we're responsible for holding the family together. How does that work? Yeah, that's a great question. And and I do work in a counseling setting. Uh, my agency is under an umbrella of faith-based. Now, not everyone I see comes from a faith-based perspective, but what you have just said is permeated throughout the Western church, the big church with the C, not just this denomination or that denomination but multiple denominations in all kinds of different cultures and areas of the country. And it is victim blaming. It, it is solely putting on, and it's rooted, grossly rooted in the patriarchy and the misogynistic view that the husband needs to be better understood and the wife needs to change. And that's just the bottom line button up. And that can come out of the mouth of female spiritual leaders. Uh -huh. That can come out of the mouth of male spiritual leaders. But it is truly the belief that the wife needs to be the helpmate and they take all kinds of scriptures and twist them around to make it where the abuser, if some cases, uh, or the manipulator or the controller or the dominator or whatever word we want to attach to that is off the hook and needs to be better understood and is quite blank, you know, kind of quite uh, bluntly said a lot of people will be like, they just need more sex. <laughs> and a, and it, it becomes spiritual abuse. It becomes sexual abuse. It becomes all kinds of abuses and control when we then start adding the religious component to it. And that's where hidden abuse gets real, real, real tricky. Yeah. And then we get this sort of bystander apathy where people 
see sort of something, but they don't speak up. They use the whole, well, what happens in that house? You know, the Lord knows the Lord's going to take care of it. The Lord's going to, and the Lord's back here. I would imagine like I put people in people's lives to help one another. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know what the Lord thinks, but I'm assuming the Jesus I know, the Jesus <laughs> I've walked with since I was 24 years old has been, and I'm not 24 now, I'm almost 53. I know that spirit and that spirit and that, that caring, loving, washing of feet, Jesus, ugh, there's going to be some people are going to have to have a, take account of what they've told women about how to handle abusive situations in their home and not just the physical abuse. Right. Because here's the thing, physical abuse, psychological abuse is always there before a physical abuse episode. Mm -hmm. So you take that physical abuse piece out, and this is what psychological abuse is, is everything leading up to it, which is where all the damage gets done. Mm -hmm. It's where all of the trauma bonding happens. It's where all of the turning inward and blaming themselves happens so that when, <clears throat> excuse me, for when of physical abuse, if that ever were to occur, does come out, the person is so wrapped up and trauma bonded, almost like having joined a cult with their abuser, that they're just, they're financially tied in, they're emotionally tied in, they've, they've got children tied in, mm -hmm. all kinds of different things. And so what we really need to be doing is backing up the education prior to physical abuse and helping people understand all of those factors that go in to the relationship prior is what we've got to be training people and spiritual leaders to understand that's where your damage is getting done before the physical comes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's also, like you said, the trauma bond, why people can't just up and leave. So, right. you know, I used to always hear where people don't leave abusive relationships because of fear and finances, but beyond just like, oh, fear, they're, they're scared. When right. you, when someone says that they automatically, I think, assume the physical abuse, you're, you, you know, you're afraid of the reaction of this person, but even stonewalling is abusive. Yes, right? it is. Because it, 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 absolutely it is. does a doozy. Can you break down what stonewalling is? I know we mentioned silent treatment, but yeah, it's pretty similar. I mean, everyone kind of figures out what their definition is for it. But for stonewalling, a lot of times you'll try to talk to the person and they just literally will not make eye contact. They will not reply back. They will talk to other people in the room. They may talk to children. They may talk to family members who call on the phone or whatever. And they're just like super Mr. or Ms. happy or whatever. But then to you, they just look right past you like you don't even exist. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. cuts to the soul. That cuts to our identity, especially if it's somebody that is supposed to be a loving partner, especially if it's someone who's supposed to be a loving family member, uh, a spiritual leader, a coworker, uh, depending on you know how close it is to our inner circle of our life is the impact that it can have for sure as it kind of you know fades out or starts to wane out. But stonewalling is truly that message of, I don't see you, you don't exist, and you don't matter. I mean, and imagine what, what more as a human being can hurt. Mm -hmm. And imagine, so what happens when you're trying to process like, well, what did I do? Again, it goes back to that. Well, you then you need to fix something, right? right. Not it is wrong to treat right. someone that way that you are in relationship with. No, you need to change your tone. You need to change the time of day that you bring something up. You need to pick your battles, you need to right? like, there's all these things. So you constantly find yourself walking on eggshells. Yes. Yes. And then the religious community would, will throw it back to, well, you need to have wisdom. And I say that with sarcasm, mm -hmm. you need to have the wisdom of when to approach this person, because you need to then have empathy to understand them. And all of a sudden, everything, the looking glass just totally gets turned in the opposite direction, rather than okay, sir, why are you so hard to deal with? Why do you not have more control over your own emotions and your own expressions of your emotions? Why do you get a free pass? And I'm over here doing all of the work to make sure that the you know, temperature and everything in the room is just perfect to approach you so that I don't get some kind of backlash. Mm -hmm. That's not 
that's not normal. That is wild. Now, I know you are loving the Redefining Wealth podcast, but do you know what would take it up a notch? It's if you invested in a copy of my brand new book, Redefine Wealth for Yourself, How to Stop Chasing Money and Finally Live Your Life's Purpose. Now on the podcast, you hear me talk about the six pillars of wealth every single week. That's fit, people, space, faith, work, and money. And I want you to incorporate this into your life. But let's be honest, the podcast isn't enough. I poured 114 lessons from my own life the rituals, the mindsets, the behaviors, the attitudes that I had to shift in order to redefine wealth for myself in each one of these pillars. And now I've made it available to you. So you can make sure to pick up your copy in paperback, hardcover, or even listen on Audible. Whatever you do, make this a part of your library today. So I love um, that I read Hidden Healing, excuse me. I love that I read Healing from Hidden Abuse. I read it, you know, post separation um, and really dug in after divorce, but it has been such a blessing as I've started to date. Yeah. Oh my <laughs> gosh. Like blessings and play blessings over you and showering over you <laughs> protection. Because I can identify things so quickly now. Yes. I can see things so quickly. And like you said, it's the psychological abuse that happens well before someone may be capable of physical abuse. Right. Mm -hmm. But what I can discern in the observation phase now within like weeks, man, I'm like, I'm ready to date because this is how I feel. I feel prepared, much more prepared because 20 years ago, I would have romanticized things and forced myself to get a, like go along to get along. Right. Yes. And yes. now I call stuff out or I acknowledge things. And even if I don't say it to you, I'm in an observation like, hmm, that's interesting, like controlling behavior or like, you know, a little emotional manipulation or um, like I was I dated a guy, um, Shannon, that said to me. Um, it's, it's like you said, the things that they really like, then they turn around and kind of like, yeah, flip it. about you. Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. So, so first it was like, oh, I want a woman of faith and a very purpose driven woman and all this stuff. I'm like, oh, well, I'm your girl. Right. Yeah, exactly. I'm so like, literally oh. on the back of my thing over here behind my yeah. head. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I, I got that in the bag. Right. Yeah. And then one morning out of the blue says, I don't know what you're doing in that prayer room, but your energy is always off when you come out of there. I am the most peaceful (laughs) person like out of the blue and then says it jokingly. Oh yeah. That that was another one. You said what's hidden abuse. Oh, uh, that Joe, you can't take a joke. Yeah. And I'm like, um, yeah. Or, uh, I stated a boundary and says, yeah, I just, I was going to give you time to get yourself together. <laughs> oh, sir, get yourself together and go ahead and hit the door. <laughs> yeah. Like get myself together. No, I'm very clear that, that this is, mm. you know, right. Mm. But I just, I, it was like five or six weeks in and out. I said, oh no. Mm. no good for you. And that's about how long it takes, but I, I really have to call out that dismissive attitude. Get mm. yourself together. Like, why do people think, hidden abusers think that they have a right to speak to another grown person in a manner that you just need to go get yourself together? Like, what pedestal have they placed themselves upon? Thus, they have the ability to speak like that to somebody that isn't going to be like, we don't have to be friends. Like, we don't have to talk. You don't have to be in my life. Yeah. That's part of the psychological abuse recovery is recognizing who we want to have access to, who we want to have access to us. Mm -hmm. And that's a gift to give. That is truly our gift is being able to email, be able to call us, to be able to be in our space, to be able to know us, to be able to, that's a gift to be given and to be, you know, earned, not in some kind of like treadmill-y thing at all. Mm -hmm. But you say foolish things like get yourself together and you just got kicked off the bus. Yeah, no access. No No access. But here's my favorite thing. Once I've learned to enforce boundaries um, and acknowledge like who no longer has access, like it is it you like 
it is a privilege to be in my presence. I like, agree. Period. Right. And I think that we should all hold ourselves to that. It is a privilege mm-hmm. to be in my presence. You don't right. get to just be in my presence because we share DNA, because right. we have relatives in common, because we go to the same church or we go here, we go there. Mm-hmm. I truly believe in any space that I occupy is sacred mm-hmm. and I want to protect the energy, right? And the safety of that space. I had to tell someone that he said, um, well, I want to be able to reach out to you whenever I feel like it. Absolutely not. I just want to be mm-hmm. able to reach out. I said, what well, gives you the idea that you should be able to have access to me like that when we've already acknowledged that you're emotionally unsafe for me. What? Right. Right. And with that, I block you. Yeah. Yeah. And with that, I block you, sir. (laughs) But what is so funny to me, Shannon, is the way that people will go off and become the victim. Yes. Yes. You just did all of this. And Uh now you want to go around and act like, I actually did something to you? Yes. Yeah. And they will create a whole narrative. So whatever their name is, I don't know what their name is. Let's just come up with the name. Like you pick a, a male name. Charles. Charles. So in Charlesville is what we call it. Charlesville, the sky is purple and the grass is a totally different color. And you have somehow offended him. And he is now the victim in Charlesville. And he'll go around and just create this whole narrative. It is crazy. Crazy, crazy, crazy. But that's where we're just like, okay, I do not want to live in Charlesville. That is just a nut place. And it's just not for me. And he can go. But that's where the smear campaign and truly being comfortable, because that's another part of the hidden abuse is being uh, a victim of a smear campaign and a constructed narrative of who we are. And what they like to do is they like to take a little bit of the truth and put it in with a whole bunch of lies, like a tiny little bit of the truth, and then put it in with a whole bunch of lies, because then it sounds more convincing. Mm -hmm. And we just have to really get comfortable with people not having the full story and get comfortable kind of with gossip. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to get real. I said this the other day, confident in the truth and comfortable with gossip. Oh, because there just comes a point, especially if you're doing the six pillars and you're starting to reach some success, however that might look in different people's lives and you're starting to feel good and you're starting to express that. People are not going to like it. They're either going to want to hitch a ride to it and then see if they can control it, or Mm -hmm. they're going to try to take it down or try to knock a chip off a little bit. And we're just going to be real confident in the truth and comfortable with gossip and just move right along and know that we are wonderfully and fearfully made and the Lord sees it all. Yeah. Yeah. I want to um, start to wind down with this, Shannon. It's from the book. You say, some not, sometimes we need to just speak and not worry about filtering our words. Recovery from psychological abuse involves having the freedom to be our authentic selves, not some watered down versions, so as not to offend the delicate senses of finicky abusers. Yeah. That freed me. Good. Good. That freed me. And yeah. it's a part of why this season is about redefining love. Um, and sharing the resources and, you know, the books, the songs, the, anything mm-hmm. that I have been using in this season, because I realize that I'm opening myself up. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, and I'm, and I've had to become comfortable with whatever comes along with it, but yeah. this is my truth. I know what I experienced. And I also know that I have a responsibility. I feel I always say this, uh, you know, influence comes with responsibility Mm -hmm. to share with others what something that Dr. Tama Bryant taught me through her book, Homecoming, Mm -hmm. which is there are a lot of successful people who experience hidden abuse. Yeah. They may be too ashamed or embarrassed to say it publicly because you Mm -hmm. do feel like, well, I should have known better. I should like, how did I not see? How did I not understand that this is what I was experiencing, all the stuff that I read or all the therapy I've had or all this, but we have to, I'll speak for myself. I know I have to give voice to this as my truth, because I don't want any other women in particular. And I know this happens on both sides, but I serve Mm -hmm. mostly women to be ashamed 
if they find themselves in this space. And I want them to know that there are resources that can help because this is not just for, you know, a woman who is downtrodden mm -hmm. and out on her luck. And, you know, she, she just has to stay in these scenarios because what else is she going to do and all this stuff? We experience this in different parts of our lives. And this is not just romantically. A lot of the book talks about even with family members and, you know, coworkers and like you said, religious spaces, but just that understanding that this is real. You're not crazy. Yes. You're not alone. Mm -hmm. There's right. Like what you feel in your body and what you're sensing in your gut and what your spirit is telling you in saying like, Hey, this isn't right. You, you don't have to live like this. You deserve better. Doesn't matter who you are. Like you don't deserve to live like that. And I just feel like, you know, resources like healing from hidden abuse, not only help give words to our experience, but it also gives a blueprint in a sense for moving forward so that we don't repeat the same right. scenarios and cycles. And I, I'm just so grateful. Good. I'm so glad that it was helpful. And actually, psychological abusers are attracted to success. So they go for strengths. So the more successful by the world's definitions that we do have blessings come to us, the more hidden abusers we're going to recognize have sort of jumped on as, you know, trying to pick little pieces of flesh. So it is not for those that, you know, oh, I'm weak or, oh, I'm this, or it's actually, you become a target, the more successful you become. And I can, I'm a therapist. This is what I specialize in. And I just, in the last, you know, quarter, figured out that I had to hit an abuser in my life and didn't really see it. My husband, who you referenced in the beginning, has been telling me for years and years and years, something's not right. I don't feel right. And I'm like, okay, I hear you, but, but making all the excuses. And then opportunity came where that curtain got pulled way back. And I had to be like, oh, okay. One, he was right. He's not always right. I'm not going to give him that, <laughs> but he was right about that. And two, they come for what they see that's sparkly and shining and working and healthy and vibrant. And I started the show saying the last few years have been so hard for us. And they just have because in 2021, it's like the hordes of hell just opened up and came for every single thing I had that was shiny and good and healthy and tried to pervert it and distort it and twist it and just staying in those pillars of what the truth is. But Anyone who feels like they're a target because they're weak. Oh, no, 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 no. Not with psychological abuse. They like to go, oh, look what she has. Look what kind of relationship she has. Look what kind of family she has. Look what kind of business. Look what kind of, and they want to just pluck off pieces like flesh. And they are aware. Oh, a hundred percent. So it's they're, not like, oh, they grew up bad and they just don't know better and all the things. Oh, friend, I grew up real bad. I grew up real hard. We all have a story. Some of us grew up real, real hard. And that's not an excuse. Mm -mm. No, no, no excuses. If someone grew up hard, they need to realize then what they're bringing into their adult life that was part of being hard growing up and not repeat that and not stand on that as some sort of excuse. Oh, no, there's no excuses allowed. Mm. Mm -mm. Oh, Shannon, you know, I want to talk to you all day, but your clients <laughs> await. I want to ask you um, our rapid wisdom questions as okay. we head out. First one is, mm -hmm. how do you define success now? Oh, that's a great question. I define success by being at peace. I define success as filling the Lord's spirit in what I'm doing. Like knowing that I know that I know where I'm supposed to be because he took me there and he opened that door and shut that door and guided me. Mm. And I know, like I got a big no recently and I was like, yes, Lord, because I know you, that wasn't for you. That wasn't from you. That wasn't for me. That wasn't from you. So that's how I right now is where I'm at peace. You know, my coach has taught me to collect impressive no's. Oh, I love that. Oh, I love that. Mm -hmm. yeah, I got a big no two weeks ago. And my first reaction was, ooh, did I do something wrong? Because that's, you know, the old stuff. 
And then I went to, thank you, Lord. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cause, and, and now after that, it's just been, Ooh, and there's a confirmation. It doesn't make anything that whoever said no to me bad at all. They're fabulous, mm-hmm. but it wasn't for me. And I actually prayed Lord, when they're looking at what it is that I have submitted, I want your spirit to come through. And if that's a no, I want them to hear like, mm, this just isn't quite right. So, or we don't have space or it just, and so when I got that, no, it was like, oh, that's exciting. Cause I know where I'm not supposed to be. So if I know where I'm not supposed to be, then I'm going to be real excited to know where I'm supposed to be. I love that. He's I so love good. That. He is so, Ooh, I, I love so that. Good. Okay. How do you define wealth in three words or less? Three words or less. Oh man. Um, freedom to be me. I'll let you have it. Cause this, that was four words, but I'm going to oh. let you be great. Friend. Okay. <laughs> freedom to, okay. My freedom. There we go. We'll go with that. <laughs> My, my own freedom. There you go. Okay. Very good. <laughs> um, what's one book that has helped you redefine wealth for yourself? Oh, I like psychology of money. That's a yes. really, really good book. I'm enjoying it a lot. It talks about greed and wealth, the difference between wealth and being rich and yeah, psychology of money. I have just been like gobbling up. I love that book. Yeah. And you have to take your time with it. Like, right. Yeah. Cause it's, it's so good. It's a good read. It's a really good read, but it's an easy read. Yeah. It, it's real. Like I laughed and I just thought it was an easy, it's not like a deep psychological book, mm-hmm. but psychology of money. I really enjoyed. Good. Okay. And fill in the blank. My name is, and to me, the truth about wealth is Ooh, my name is Shannon. And to me, the truth about wealth is you can define it for yourself. Yes, you can. I love it. Shannon, thank you so much for being here. Um, Listen, you guys, healing from hidden abuse. Let me tell you, even if you're not sure if you've ever experienced psychological abuse or hidden abuse, read the book so that you're aware of the signs. Because if you are in a scenario where, you know, you're just not certain you might be able to pick up on the red flags. I'm going to say you definitely will be able to pick up on the red flags and also be guided through the six stages of, you know, healing from hidden abuse, which are really powerful. Um, You guys, this season again is all about redefining, you know, love, love for yourself, love for others and love of God. And I just want to continue to pour these resources into you and these conversations into you. Let me know how you are growing, what you're taking away. Make sure that you find me on Instagram, Seek Wisdom PCW, and let us know what you think about the episode. And Shannon, what's your handle on Instagram? Shannon Thomas. It's really simple. (laughs) Really easy. Shannon (laughs) Thomas. And make sure that you comment and DM and let Shannon know what a blessing she is and what you took away from the episode as well. Until next week, you guys, I want you to go live your life's purpose, find fulfillment and earn more without ever chasing money. We'll talk to you later.